I'm going to hand it over to Esther, and I'd like everyone to, to meet Esther. She is a colleague of ours, so she's from Brady, Canada, and she has been a customer service rep, and she's been with Brady for 18 years. Yes. Yes, it's very exciting. So among other things that you can share with <laughs> us, um, I'm going to hand it off to you and then take it away. Thank you so much. I want to say that this uh, experience today is a privilege and it's an honor for me to be here. Um, Women's Leadership Alliance, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just have to say that having the opportunity to shed light on bipolar disorder is um, absolutely wonderful to me right? that I have got to do this because it is just such an opportunity. Headquarters, Brady, Milwaukee, awesome. So my older brother said, now Esther, that is a big deal. And what we want to tell you is a little bit of advice. I said, okay, I'm ready, give it away. He said, well, I just don't want you to screw it up. <laughs> so I thought to myself, how lovely. So, so after David gave me that stellar advice, I thought to myself, what a family. So let me tell you a little bit about my family so you'll know about me and uh, how I grew up. I, I had two parents that were uh, revered. They were respected. They were honored in the community. They were people that were both um, high acclaimed teachers and everybody knew them. My mom had high, high expectations for all of her children. And um, if we didn't measure up, which we normally didn't, uh, we would hear about it. She was super strict. She was very uh, domineering and overpowering. And uh, she just wanted her children to excel, but she had a hard way of expressing it. So that was hard. Both of those parents as teachers. And then I had older siblings. I have an older brother, Tim. He had a high IQ. He was uh, just absolutely brilliant, could study and learn and absorb anything. He was incredible with his hands and he could also uh, tell a story like nobody else. Then my next sibling was my brother, David. He was the gregarious one, the public speaker, the one that went everywhere and he was asked to speak at weddings and uh, be in variety shows. And he became a, a world-class lawyer in a very prestigious US city and uh, he was, both of them were incredibly hard to follow. So then after that, I had a sister and uh, she was six years older. And uh, she, keep in mind, I battled my whole life with my weight. So um, that was always an issue with me. I wasn't very successful, still battle it today. And here's Rebecca, she came along and she was a hundred pounds soaking wet and uh, never had a problem with her weight. She was drop dead gorgeous. She was super talented. She could sing like a, an angel and was always asked to perform at a variety shows and musicals and every man in town wanted to date her. So I had those two parents and I had these three siblings and it was very, very difficult to uh, find my place and uh, just to wonder where I fit in. I really wanted to fit in more than anything else and I was having a hard time doing that. So here I am just at the tender age of eight years old and I'm thinking, well, maybe this will help me fit in. My brother was having a party in the backyard and what happened was, uh, you know, of course, you've got alcohol there, you've got smoking, you've got loud music and what I would do is just skirt around, see if I could lift a few bottles of beer from here and there. And uh, I found my brother's cigarette pack and I took three or four cigarettes there, went to the side of the house. It's in the dark, I'm all alone, and I started to smoke. And of course you choke and gasp and you're <laughs> barely able to breathe, but I kept with it <laughs> so that I could be a smoker. And then I drank all that beer. I loved how it felt. It made me feel just amazing. And I thought to myself, this is kind of fun, but you know, it was secretive and it was by myself and uh, very young. You think, okay, that's childhood pranks. But unfortunately, that led to behavior and an addiction that I had for years and years and years. And that was very difficult. So I went off to high school and I thought, okay, maybe I'll have a better start here. Um, I haven't had a great track record even at my age. And I thought, okay, I'm going off to high school. And unfortunately, I like to do anything that was wrong, anything that was rebellious, anything that just gave me that adrenaline. 
So what I did was I like to say I borrowed, but what I did was I stole three cars. The first one was my brother's uh, Pride and Joy, his satellite seed ring plus. It was in the garage and I tried to back out in a curved driveway. And what I did was I smashed it from one bumper all the way to the other on the uprights of the, uh, of the garage. So I've just pulled back in and two days later, later they discovered it and I denied it to the hilt. Of course they knew it was me, but I just lied about it. The next car that I had, I took out my dad's pride and joy and it was a rainy uh, Sunday afternoon, never forget that, and it was out in the country. So we had gravel and we had dirt roads and we had all kinds of things out there. It's a V8 engine. So here I took off from a stop sign and gunned it and went right into a ditch hit a tree, had to be towed out, and uh, tried to get the car home before my dad would see it. And of course, when he did, I don't think I've ever seen my father upset in his entire life, but of course, I, I brought that out in him that day. He was not happy. So there was uh, another car I took out, quote unquote, successfully. I made it to my youth pastor's uh, house and he was so concerned when he found out I had driven. This is all at 14 and 15 years old, way before I got a license. And so this is what was going on. None of my other friends were doing anything like this, but I just was determined to do things that I knew were wrong. So I made it back from my youth pastor's house. He was so worried. He wanted me to change my life. He wanted me to, you know, become a better person. And I just wasn't interested. And I just left him kind of in the dust there. So the next thing you know, I'm 16. And I actually get a license. And I'm now driving. And I'm driving so fast. And I'm driving so amazingly, um, recklessly. So here I am driving through stop signs. And uh, here's the problem. I'm just flicking off the lights. I'm driving 100 miles an hour and my heart is pounding. And for me, I thought that was kind of an interesting, fun experience. Now, I said I drove drunk and that's, um, you know, only by the grace of God that I didn't kill someone or, you know, get in a horrible wreck and kill myself. So those things are going on at 16. So all of a sudden, something happened uh, that kind of changed the course of my life for a while. I was out right, horseback riding with friends and I dove off a horse, got thrown from a horse and uh, broke both of my arms. I had casts all the way up to my shoulders and my mom had to take me to the bathroom. She had to feed me. Uh, she had to tutor me, get in tutors from the high school. So here I had teachers <laughs> that, you know, not your biggest people, fun people in the world. There they are at my dining room table tutoring me. And um, I had VON, Victorian Order of Nurses, come in every day and they would dress me and they would uh, shower me, shower me and dress me. And I thought, you know, I'm reduced to absolutely nothing. It was a good time for me to slow down. I think that that's what the purpose was of that. So I did slow down and I did manage to finish high school and that was great. So then the next thing you know, I'm off to uh, university. Now, um, I'm trying to save up money on one of the summer semester times and I'm at my brother's house with his wife and I'm staying there working in a restaurant. Now I'm making pretty good money, but one day I went to a store and I can't tell you it was not premeditated. I just decided it would be fun if I would take things. So I would take sunglasses, rip off the tags, put the sunglasses on my head. I would go up and down the aisles just taking things for the adrenaline pump that I got. Now, I went through the whole store. There's a few things I was gonna check out with and pay for. And um, when I checked out, there was the store manager. Little did I know that he was videotaping me the whole way. So I was um, arrested. I was taken to the police headquarters there in Houston. And I was just a few dollars shy of a felony. So if, I would have had that laid against me, my life would have changed dramatically. So here I was having, they placed a call to my brother. He's trying to make a name for himself, brand new lawyer, and he gets the call to go bail out his little sister. You can imagine. So the um, he came, he picked me up, and uh, that was the most icy, silent call that you, I mean, drive home that you could ever imagine. 
So it was a very um, a humiliating time. I felt like dirt. I walked in the door and there was my sister-in-law. She saw the imprints of the handcuffs on my wrists and she kissed my wrists. And I never forgot that. And she's one of my most favorite people ever in the world because of that kindness that sticks with you. So that was very, very hard. So I went back to university, um, hoping a new start, no trouble, let's graduate. Well, here's what happened. Um, there was a scholarship available for religious life. And that means I'd be planning the chapels for the, um, the upcoming year. And it was a partial scholarship and I thought, how wonderful. So I went after that and I uh, was nominated and I ran and I won by a landslide. So I thought, this is fantastic. I was so excited and so blessed to have it. I thought, this is great. This is my new beginning. This is what is going to change uh, my, the course of my life. So wouldn't you know that because I won, I wanted to celebrate. And for me, always celebration meant alcohol. So I went out, and keep in mind, this is a private Christian school that I'm going to. And I went out and I got plastered. And I was so drunk, I could barely stumble in the dorm later on that night. So the RA, the resident advisor, uh, obviously noticed that I was drunk. She reported me. The very next day, the dean of the university called me in and said, Esther, that's one of the rules. We can't have that broken. Um, we're gonna take away your scholarship. We're going to ask you to leave the school. Uh, we've deemed it necessary to call your parents. In fact, they're here right now. So if anything you can imagine that would uh, put my heart on the ground was the fact that my dear parents from Stobel, Ontario, Canada, drove all the way down to Oklahoma City. And there they were. Now, I will say they were very kind to me. They, of course, were disappointed and um, they, uh, you know, we had some long conversations, as you can imagine, and they took me home. So I'm at home, back in my hometown, in my parents' um, uh, house, and I thought to myself, what I want to do more than anything in the world is get back there to graduate. Now, I can't tell you the real reasons why, other than I wanted to prove that I could do it. I wanted to prove that no matter what, I would um, graduate. Now, my mom, the strongest woman I've ever met, she said, no, Esther, don't go down there. People will be talking about you. It'll be too hard. Don't do it. But I just had to. I wanted to graduate so badly. So I bundled up my car. I drove all the way down to Oklahoma City. And um, I'm back on campus. I will say there's a handful of friends that stood by me. And uh, they were loyal. And they were incredible to me, still are to this day. But if you think of a small campus and you think of what I got kicked out for, having that religious life scholarship. I was talked about, I was stared at, I was gossiped about. It was probably the hardest experience to point to that date that I had ever been through. Um, I did graduate and um, to that day, that was the proudest I'd ever been in my life. I had gone back and faced, you know, the people just ignored you or looked the other direction when you passed in the hallway. It was awful. But I, uh, I did it and I got that psychology degree and I was so, so proud of that. So that's what happened in university. It was quite an experience. And um, I thought, okay, this is um, you know, something I can build on. And unfortunately, the years went by and I drank more and more. Uh, I was using it to, to be my cure-all. It, it became something that was so important to me. I think we can all agree that if you drink at work, if you drink in the mornings, and if you drink alone, or all of those, then you do have a problem. And I certainly did have a problem. I didn't uh, think that I could ever, um, you know, function without it. And uh, it was getting pretty bad at this point. So I thought to lift up my spirits, I would surprise my mom in May um, for Mother's Day. And the year was 1992. So I decided that it would be a complete surprise and it worked. She was surprised. We had a great church service. We went to lunch. We had a wonderful time. And then the parents uh, took me to the airport. They circled around me, uh, prayed over me for traveling mercies and said, take care of yourself. We had a tearful goodbye. And then I was into the airport in Toronto. Now, after such a warm and wonderful time, what did I do? I went straight to a bar. 
And I'm in a bar in the Toronto airport. And you know, like every bar, there's the bottles. And then behind that are, are the mirrors. So I'm sitting at the bar with a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other. And I didn't like what I saw. Now, if you are a person that's not abusing and not, um, you know, obsessed with alcohol or tobacco, then that's fine. That's your choice. But for me, I saw it as it ruined my life. It was ruining my life in so many ways. And I thought, you know, you, you can't keep doing this any longer. So on the flight back to Texas, where I lived at that time, I, I said, Esther, that is your last cigarette. That is your last drink. And that date was May 11, 1992. Now, to be asked to do this on May 11, 2022, is mind boggling to me, the timing, because that's 30 years I've had of sobriety. And I'm forever grateful for that. Um, and I'm very, very proud of, uh, of that accomplishment. And it's nice to celebrate it here with my Brady folks, you in the US and up here in Canada, it's a, it's a great day. So, um, you know, you think, okay, no alcohol, no tobacco, your life is gonna turn around, it's gonna be amazing. Unfortunately, it was not amazing. Um, what happened was without that panacea, without that, um, I guess that cure-all or coping mechanism, whatever you wanna call it, I didn't have that anymore. And I started to get worse. I started to spiral. And um, I, I didn't know where I was going. I just know I was just circling and circling and going down. And uh, it got to the point where I couldn't function anymore. I mean, I was that person drinking at work, styrofoam cup in the back weight station and just drinking all day. I was doing it in secret. I was doing it alone. And it was bad. It got so bad that I, I couldn't call into work. I couldn't... Um, answer the phone, talk to family or friends. My best friend at that time, uh, Janice, she brought in a, a manager from my apartment complex just to open the door to see if I was dead or alive. It was that bad. So I made the hardest phone call I think I've ever had to make. And I'm, I said, mom, I'm not doing well. I'm not functioning. I'm not uh, gonna be able to make it. I need your help. And I'll give her all the credit in the world. She got in her car. And uh, I'm sorry, she flew down and we drove back in my car all the way back up to Canada. And uh, when I got there, um, this has never happened to me before for such a long time, but I stayed in my parents' basement for one solid year. I wasn't talking to people. I wasn't doing anything. I was up at night and I was sleeping all day. And I had some friends come by and say, let's go, go, go. You got to get up. Didn't help. Now, I did have a friend named Sue. She came by, she just sat at the edge of the bed and she just talked or just listened. You know, she was soft-spoken, she was sweet, she was wonderful. And that changed me, that touched me, that got me out of bed. She said, there's a Weight Watchers deal at the church and I'd like you to come with me if you want. And I thought, how fun, how great. So I went with her and that got me out of bed. Then the next thing you know, I got out of bed and went to work, I got a job. It didn't last but over a year, but uh, nonetheless, I was out of bed, I was functioning, I got an apartment, I moved out of my parents' place. It was a really good experience for me. Then um, I got another job when that one fizzled and it was great, it was about a year. I enjoyed it, everything was perfect. And, um, you know, I think it went off, it dissolved or whatever it did. And that left me looking for another job. So in 99, I found what I thought was the dream job. It was at a place called Brands Elite and they hired me uh, and I was autonomous. I was my own boss. I had my own office. I could come and go as I pleased. It was incredible. Uh, fossil watch repair was at 12 weeks. They said, if you can do anything less than that, we'd be so excited. And so what happened was that I was bound and determined to drop that 12 weeks. And I did, I got it down to seven days. They were ecstatic. And I was even more and more heady, excited. Wow, this job is it. Now, my problem was it became my be all and end all. I was coming in super early. I was leaving really late. 
you know, so that nine to five was completely gone. I was more like six to eight or nine. And I did that day after day. I was just so excited to get to work. It was taking over my life. I didn't know it. So in April of the year 2000, I was doing something strange. I would go into the ladies room and I would start cleaning. So I would clean the cubicles and I would clean the floor, um, toilets, walls, anything in sight. And that could be with toilet water or that could be with regular water. It didn't matter. But when somebody came in, I stopped. So I knew that there was something odd. And then when they left, I would resume. So that week I was doing that more and more and more. So it got to be an obsession with me. Um, still not really cognizant of what I was doing, but just enough to think hmm, odd, but not odd enough to stop completely. I just kept doing it. So on the Friday of that week, which was April 7, 2000, I walked up the hallway. I went into my boss's office. She was not there. I shut the door. I locked the door. I went behind her desk. I sat in her chair. I put my feet on her desk. I thought, oh, this is great. I'm boss for the day. And I mean, people piece together things that happened for me. Otherwise, I would not remember. But I was answering the phone as Kathy and, hey, what can I do for you? And, and slamming down the phone. Next thing you know, there were people pounding at the window behind from the parking lot. There were people pounding at the door trying to get in. The keys were locked in there with me. And I um, was oblivious. I had a complete break with reality. I didn't know what was going on. They were so concerned. So they ended up calling the authorities. Fire truck, ambulance, and police all came. The police came and tried to reason with me through the door. I would not. They finally had to break down the door. They came over to me and handcuffed me. They led me out the long hallway to the front door. And there was a waiting ambulance to take me to Markham Stovall Hospital. In that ambulance, I, I promise you, I thought I was in a Learjet and I was off to meet the queen. I thought, this is fantastic. I love the queen. So I thought, this is perfect. Of course, she'd want to meet me. Why wouldn't she? So I was so, so, so high. There was a nurse there that told me a few days later, she said, I gave you sedative. And I gave you more sedatives than I've ever given anyone in my 25-year nursing career just to bring me down. The next day, I met the most phenomenal man, Dr. Mark Berber. Now, what he gave me was a gift. And that gift, uh, I treasure to this moment. He said, Esther, you have bipolar disease. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I have something. I have something you can name, you can study, you can work on managing. This explains behavior. He said, you probably had it since you were 15. I was then 37. That's 22 years of not knowing what I had, what I uh, was dealing with, the behaviors that were so erratic. You know, people saw depression and they tried to treat me with antidepressants, very harmful for somebody with bipolar. But that's what happened to me because people were trying. They just didn't know. I wasn't asked the right questions. So Dr. Mark Berber, he saved my life. He got me on medication and I was in the hospital for two weeks. Then I was in outpatient for four. So at the end of that six weeks, I'm home. I'm thinking, I want to go back to that place of employment. And my mom, once again, no, my no, Esther, you don't want to do that. They'll all be talking about you. It'll be awful. You know, no need to put yourself through that. I said, mom, I want to prove that people with mental health issues can get help. They can go back and be productive. They can work again. And so there was no stopping me. So about uh, nine weeks after the whole thing happened in April, I'm driving to work. They're setting me up part time. I just about to open my door and who's there but Kathy, my boss, the one that I commandeered her office. And she said, hey girl, I'm here to walk you in. Now that's support. That is just uh, brought tears. It was just amazing to me. So I came in, once again, handful of people, super kind, wonderful, and I appreciate them. The rest of the office, huge, huge office uh, population, um, ignored, uh, looked the other way, and they looked frightened. And to tell you the truth, you can't really blame them. They weren't educated, they didn't know, and um, it was unnerving for them. 
but I went back way back in, in those in that year 2000 when mental health uh, isn't popular to talk about like it is now and that was a huge challenge and I I'm so glad I did that and it proved that I had the courage and the determination to do that and um, I'm very grateful for that you know you can put up with anything if you think um, of a little bit more highly of your strength and um, you know your courage and character gets developed during those really hard times so I was glad I did that so after being in the hospital and back to work um, I tried to piece together my my mind and my life they go hand in hand it was a very difficult time I took many steps forward Unfortunately, I took maybe six or seven back, and then you take a step forward and go back. But over time, I, I learned how to walk again. I learned how to think. I learned how to piece together all those uh, pieces of the puzzle that were just shattered on that day. Um, so when I, and it came to the year 2003, now I have to tell you, this is a huge, huge thing. And I think each and every one of you out there will be excited by this. But I interviewed at a company called Brady. And uh, Anna, who interviewed me, she, for some unknown wonderful reason, she hired me. And I'll tell you, that was the, the beginning of something really amazing and quite a love affair because um, Brady is family to me. Uh, I don't have any family close in, the, in, my, in my area with a lot of people unfortunately have passed away. So Brady has become more and more meaningful to me. And um, I have been, as uh, Teresa said, here 18 years. And I am really, really grateful for that. I, I have to tell you that um, I thought long and hard, should I tell anybody about my bipolar? Should I tell them what I've been through? And I said resoundedly, no do not open your mouth don't discuss it keep it to yourself and that'll be fine so 2003 to 2016 that's 13 years i kept it to myself and i just came into work every day um i decided that um it would be a good idea to tell my boss Chantel. i thought uh, i like her i trust her and i really want her to know so um, I had a really uh, hard time getting up my nerve. <laughs> so I would go into her office and start to talk and then talk about something else. <laughs> and then I would leave. And I think I did that two or three times, getting up the nerve to say, hey, Chantel, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. And I finally shut the door, did that, and told her my bipolar story. I'll tell you something. She was supportive she was kind i think the biggest thing was she listened without judgment you can always tell in someone's eyes if they're like oh my you know she, she didn't do any of that she showed compassion she had tears in her eyes when i told her about some of the hard times i'd been through that was the turning point of my uh, mental health uh, life um i have had no end of uh, opportunities because of talking to her. Why? Because then I had courage to tell um, a colleague, uh, Kim. She was very supportive. She was enthusiastic that I had told her. She was proud of me. And I thought, wow, here's two people right here at Brady. That opened the door for more dialogue, more conversation, more and more and more. And it all started with Chantel. So you cannot um, tell me that one person can't change a life. They certainly can. So that led to my doctor calling me out of the blue after this and said, we're doing an article in the hospital magazine. We want it to be about you. Um, you can go anonymous. You can just go by Esther or you can go Esther Herbert. And I said to myself and to him, let's go Esther Herbert. Let's kick down some stigma. We need to get after this. So that article came out and uh, that was the beginning of speeches and all kinds of wonderful things that have happened. And it all seemed to just connect. Once you open up and become vulnerable, it's amazing what things can happen. So now I wanna to talk to you about what I would call the most um, important, 
part of this whole talk. Uh, this is, as you saw by the title, Piercing the Darkness Through the Light of Hope. So here are my hope list. Here's my lights. Here are things that you've seen enough darkness. You've heard all about it. So now I want to share with you these wonderful things that have just been amazing to me because of getting through uh, the bipolar, um, not knowing, and then with the diagnosis, this is what's happened. So the very first thing is I wanted to say is longevity of bipolar wellness. Now for me, it's being faithful to all of the regime, the routine, the medication, the doctor, um, all of that will attribute to wellness. Now that doesn't happen for everyone. Many people start off great and then feel better and quit their medication or whatever routine they're on, they think they're fine and they drop it or they quit talking to their therapist or they quit talking to their family members or whatever it might be that helps them and they think they're fine. And unfortunately, um, they're not. And we see that many, many times. So sticking to the program uh, has helped me tremendously. And I'm very proud of that. The second thing I think you will be equally excited about is the fact that I have maintained my position here at Brady for 18 years. This is a place that I'm proud to call home. This is a place I'm proud to come to every day. And this is a place that houses some very important people to me. And um, I am so excited to say I've been here 18 years. I'm very grateful. Um, also, another light hope for you is uh, I have a YouTube channel. I started out a few years back and now I have about 85 or 90 uh, videos. Uh, I just call them video chats and they're about mental health issues and they're to be encouraging and give people a boost. They're about five minutes long. If you ever want to subscribe, Esther Herbert, you see my picture and please do because I would love that. Ted from Brady USA, he said to me one day, he said, um, you'll never know how many lives you are touching through those videos. And I thought, what a wonderful, kind comment. It was very encouraging to me. So YouTube channel is another light. Now this one might be controversial because I don't think a lot of people agree, but I will tell you it's true in my life. I have the strength to be vulnerable. I believe that once you open up and you show that vulnerability, people will respond to it. They will in turn maybe share their story or something about their lives, their parents, something, and they will talk about mental health. Now, I want to open the dialogue anytime I can, and I believe me being vulnerable like I am today sharing my story, I think it is a sign of um, strength, and I think it will be for you as well. So I'm very proud of that one as well. Now, think of it, drinking at eight years old and now 30 years sober. So I couldn't get more excited about that on the day than sharing it with you folks today. So that's a good one. Now, I think the very best one for me is my mom. Now, when you think about an 88-year-old woman, set in her ways, um, grew up in the Depression era, and um, never talking about mental health, and saying that doesn't run in our family, and all of a sudden she's at my speeches talking about mental health. She's there in the front row. She's clapping. She's on board 100%. She's handing out my magazine articles or my business cards and saying, my daughter has bipolar, and I want you to talk to her. Uh, I think the most exciting thing was um, 88 to 95, seven years of a beautiful relationship. She passed away at 95 in 2020. And she said to me, she said, you know, Esther, we need to write Reader's Digest on, on what a incredible mother-daughter relationship that we have. Now, I'll tell you, that touched my heart and uh, touches my heart this moment because I love my mom, miss her every day. But to have that relationship, that was a gift. And I'm very thankful for that. And the last thing is, uh, I wonder where God went during all this time. You know, here I am having darkness and problems and pain and humiliation. And a lot of it brought on myself, but it was still painful. And I wondered where he was. But, you know, in retrospect and getting a clearer picture, I realized he was right beside me or carrying me. And he provided the biggest light of all. So I'm very thankful for that. Okay, now I do want to go back to um, something that's super important to me. I want to talk about the game changer, the life alterer, the way maker. Now, who am I talking about? I'm talking about my manager. 
you know, she could have uh, responded very differently. And I think to myself, what if she was cold, indifferent, dismissive, didn't have the time, prone to gossip, or full of the stigma so many workplaces today have? What if she judged me? She cast a shadow of a doubt about my life. What if she in turn treated me differently after our conversation, a little less human? You know, we've made great strides in corporations, but um, they are still full of people who have no idea how to respond to or guide people with mental health issues. I have had friends who've had horrible experiences uh, through workplace mental health shunning. They've been humiliated, disgraced, and isolated. I was blessed. I was fortunate. I had a manager that checked all of my boxes, every single one of them, and that's what I needed. I'm forever grateful, Chantel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now I believe there's two sets of people out here listening to me today. You might be in need of a caring ear. Uh, you're struggling. You might need someone you can trust. Or you are in a position to listen without judgment. Give support. Just be open to hearing somebody else's story. If they trust you, then that will open the door for them to talk to you, for you to show some compassion. That is so important. You know, nobody does it alone. Nobody can. We've just been through and experiencing a pandemic. There's a war raging in Ukraine right now. Our mental health is stretched to the limit and we need each other. And you know, mental health issues are no respecter of persons. Recently, we had Naomi uh, Judd. Uh, she died by suicide, 76 years old, very famous. And she had severe depression and resistance to medication. And it's pitiful. Now, is she more important than you or I? No, but when you're famous, it sheds a broader light. And I think it's important to talk about it because it is out there. It strikes everywhere. I believe that compassion and empathy never grow old. If you can reach out, if you're capable, please, I, I pray that you do. If you can listen, it'll make such a difference. I know it makes all the difference in the world. So we need to do that and we need to do it now. We can't wait. It is the time. Keep making the strides that we are and keep it going. So as I conclude today, I want you to really hear this. You matter. Your mental health matters. And I want to repeat this part. You matter tremendously. Please remember that. Thank you, Women's Leadership Alliance. Thank you for each and every one of you out there listening. That is a great gift. I appreciate it. Teresa Schmidt, I appreciate you asking me here to speak today. It's been an absolute honor and a privilege. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much, Esther. I mean, the, the time that you spent with us is very, very helpful and very enlightening. Um, we're going to open it up to some q a so as i mentioned earlier we have two opportunities if you'd like to ask her directly um you can do the q a in the discussion i'll kind of ask the questions for you Great. or we have the anonymous option which i'm going to send in the link again um but please uh if you have any questions even if we don't get to it in our session we can share it with esther and she can give some responses yes um so there's actually a question from jane um I'm gonna actually read it <laughs> directly here. Hi, it's Jane from Brady, Canada. Thank you, Esther, for sharing your story here today. That must, uh, that must not have been easy and you definitely made me shed a few tears listening to your story. By the way, I agree. Please let us know what motivates you to tell it here today. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, the motivation comes from, I think the pain of what I've been through um, the misdiagnosis, 
um, the years of not knowing and the questions that I went through, um, I don't want anyone to have a longer misdiagnosis or lack of diagnosis ever. You know, I, I believe that we can change people's lives by listening. Um, I don't think we have all the answers, but I also know that they can get help. Um, I think that the, like Chantel, she listened. She didn't, you know, she wasn't a doctor. She couldn't prescribe anything, but the listening portion changed my life. So I want to break down the stigma. I think it's prevalent in a lot of places. And unfortunately, through my studies, workplace is, is the place it's the highest. So for me to be able to talk about mental health issues on a forum like this is a privilege beyond words because I want people to understand that they are not alone. There are people out uh, there that care about you in your circle, or even it's amazing how they'll just be brought up on your path. You know, um, you might not have expected to hear me today and go up and talk about what I did, but I was brought for a reason and there are people all around you that are brought for a reason. So Jane, that's an excellent question. I did it because I want stigma gone and I did it because I want people to feel hope. Thank you, Esther. Um, this question actually is related to what you just spoke about, but what does it mean to have uh, to have been asked by Brady to speak at this event? <laughs> well, I mean, it's uh, it's very hard to put that one into words because it's so exciting and such a thrill. I mean, you know, this is my company and this is a company that I'm so proud of. And I see it as this shows me leadership at Brady is interested in mental health issues. This tells me that, you know, if a program is to be successful in a company, it has to start at the top. And for this to be a leadership alliance and so many people in the invitation hold um, management or senior positions, I mean, that is wonderful because that's going to trickle down to all of us. It can't start at the bottom, it has to start at the top. So for them, you to ask me to come and talk about this particular topic in a place it shows me Brady is right on the cutting edge of mental health and you know that's something to be so proud of because we need it now more than ever pandemic war our own lives dear Naomi Judd people in the media everywhere are suffering we're all suffering and we need ways to cope and to have it happen at work where we spend most of our time that to me is an absolute privilege and a joy. And I, I thank you again for that. Thank you for that. Uh, another question, what do you do to maintain your bipolar wellness? <laughs> That's a great question. Whoever asked that, thank you so much. Because I try to tell people, um, we're all impatient at times. We want wellness and we want it in a nice little box and it's just there. But unfortunately, it takes work. It takes discipline. Um, a person with my particular uh, disorder likes routine. So I am very routine oriented. <laughs> Ask anybody I work with, I eat the same thing for lunch every day. You know, it's, a, it's just a routine. I walk after work, that's routine. But I mean, these are good things for you. I see my doctor regularly. I do blood tests regularly. Um, um, I think that it's most important to open up and talk to people around you, not just professionals um, and share if you're having a rough day and share with your best friend if it's awful, you know, don't keep it in. Um, I think, you know, communing with nature is amazing. Um, but for me, it's making sure that, well, I don't drink. So that's very helpful for the medication. So I'm really glad I don't, you know, um, you have to take care of yourself. You have to exercise, you know, people with mental health issues, need to do the regular things that most people do even more because it's so important. Now, if I don't get enough sleep, I pay for it. You know, so those are the things, you know, bipolar, I lean toward mania. So it's uh, very hard for me to get good, good hours of sleep, especially last night, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, um, it was very important that I get my hours of sleep in and, uh, you know, it's it's a it's an adventure. My my particular disorder has no uh, cure, but that doesn't mean I can't manage it. And that's what I'm doing. And that gives you a sense of empowerment because you're in charge. You know, and uh, 
the disease will sometimes rear its ugly head in weird ways, but I'm still the person managing. And I want to tell people there's hope to do that. No matter if you have depression or whatever, mental health, anxiety, anything you're going through, there is hope. Thank you. <clears throat> what do you think are the most important things you can do to support a child who suffers from a mental health concern? Well, since I was, um, he said 15 is when he thought I might have it. And here I am drinking at eight years old. So I'm thinking I might have had it earlier. Um, to support, I think the key, especially with children, is you know how sometimes you look over top of and you're not really eye contact and it's like, yes, dear, you know, but kids need to be heard as much as adults, if not more. They, they need to sense that you're involved and that you care. Now, they may resent some of the things you suggest, but um, that you keep your eye out for a, a very peculiar or odd behavior. You know, if they're spending all their time in the room, all their time alone, no friends. I mean, these are red flags that pop up. You know, uh, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, but what I could say for me is that I always reclused. I was depressed at times and I would just pull myself away completely. So be aware of that. Um, children, if they feel that they're loved and cared for, they're very apt to come and say, mom, dad, whoever, I need to talk to you. And be open to dropping everything when they say something like that. Not later, hon, later, hon, later. Do it then. Okay. Um, what are some of the resources or readings or I guess uh, different things that people can use to learn how to support either their peers or people around them? Well, you know, I love to read the latest articles on bipolar. And um, I also like to read um, how can you support someone with bipolar? Because, you know, it's not a, a lonely road. It's not all by yourself. So if I say I want you to kind of look for something that's out of the usual, like on Fridays I get really hyper and I've asked um, – somebody at work to watch me on that day and also my best friend on that day because you don't want to swing out of you know um what you are used to dealing with so um resources always i just google almost everything i like to know medication is there any hope for a cure um and how do you support uh it's an amazing thing because people think you have to do a lot but there's really not a do it's it's that listening spending time, even just walking in silence, you know, take a, a partner and go and just do a nature walk or just around the block walk. And, um, you know, if people want to talk, they'll talk. If not, um, then you learn a little bit more. Maybe you bring it up. Um, it, every person is different, but I know I respond to people who put no pressure on me. You know, they're not like Esther, let's go, go, go. I don't like that. You know, I like the soft spoken, sweet people that say, hey, if you want to, I'm here. You know, that type of thing. But you have to, some people need that motivation and they're differently wired. But uh, I particularly like soft spoken and kind. And uh, anybody who listens to me, uh, I find them quite exciting. I love them. All right. Well, those are all the questions we have received or the ones that we had available. If anyone has any other questions, please let us know. Um, we'll give you guys another moment if you're writing. But Esther, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, I understand the effort that you put into this and all of our previous discussions. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us, uh, especially about your experiences and your, your growth and your hope. So thank you very much for that. And I speak with, along with everybody that's been sending messages, congratulations on your 30 years. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, it just happened to be the best date for us to schedule this. So thank you very much again for that. Yes, thank you. I couldn't believe it when you said that the 11th. I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that is our time. But if anyone has any additional questions, we'll leave that, uh, that form up and we can follow up with Esther to answer some of your your questions. So thank you very much again, everyone. Um, we have recorded this session. We'll make sure that it is available to anybody and we'll let you know when that link is available. Great. So thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thank you.